am Meryl Ross, and I've been an equity analyst um, for the past 30, 30 years. Um, and I've known Sam for 12 of those years. Um, and I've been a, an enthusiastic proponent of affordable housing. I, I really care about how this country houses millennials um, and the elderly as well. And I, I think, you know, UMH, in a sense, is a company that's on a mission to provide affordable housing. And I'm just meeting Bill Bohr of CAVCO for the first time, but I sense that he also understands the mission of housing America. That's good. I'm Sam Landy, president and CEO of UMH Properties. My father, Eugene Landy, founded UMH 55 years ago. Uh, our team provides quality, affordable housing through manufactured homes in communities for sale or rent. Uh, we're proud providers of CAVCO product and this is a great it's called the innovative housing showcase because this is true innovation in reducing the cost of quality affordable housing all right hi i'm bill Bohr. i'm the president and ceo of cavco industries cavco is one of the largest national builders of manufactured housing uh, we've got 31 manufacturing plants across the country we also have a large and growing retail operation where we're dealing directly with the home buyer and we've got a lending company and an insurance company. So we kind of cover a lot for the homeowners. Uh, we're very focused. We've got approximately 7,000 employees that are very focused on building quality, affordable housing for, to get families into great places to live that wouldn't have that opportunity otherwise. Uh, overall, we've got the capability of building over 20,000 homes a year. Hi, thank you for joining me here at this Innovative Housing Showcase. Um, we're particularly excited this year um, since you're showcasing a duplex, um, which is rare in the industry. I've never known of it before. So maybe you can describe to me some of the features that you think enhance this home and maybe who your targeted audience is. Yeah. And be great to have Sam's thoughts on the audience too because we're really working as partners on that but yeah last year we showed the first duplex that was actually subsequently approved under the HUD code right. it was um, that was a two section duplex mm -hmm. so um, a bit larger but this is another innovation where we're doing a one section duplex so two completely separate and independent living quarters you know everything's everything you'd expect in in a self-contained house there's a firewall in between that separates and you know these are running kind of right around 540 square feet each so um, the benefit is really density and all the benefits that that brings I mean being able to put a unit like this in for example um, a community but certainly in an urban area where you have infill and be able to get two housing units in where previously we would only have been able to get one um, but certainly there's benefits in that for the community operator if we think about that end point. And there's uh, affordability advantages for the right. residents as well, of course, that comes with that density. Right, so there are three parties that benefit, right? There's the, the seller of the home, yep. there's the operator of the community, but then there's the, the families right. that live in this. So how much more affordable do you think this looks um, from the, I'm going to represent the, 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 the resident, okay? Uh, how much better off would I be renting or buying a home in your community that was densified? A house like this, the one we're in, the, the two halves, it's going to be on one lot. So previously we'd rent out one house for about $1,000 per month. By putting two units on the one lot, these could be $800 per month per half. And for the customer, uh, the baby boomers who are now you know, 65 and older, if they're looking for a one bedroom at $800 per month, with this quality, they're gonna be on a 5,000 square foot lot. It's a shared lot, but it's still a 5,000 square foot lot. They, they won't find anything of this quality with this space in those price ranges. And when you look at people's incomes today, uh, if you have $40,000 household income, you can afford to live in this unit. And so we think there's a huge market that's going to have additional money. Their savings on rent uh, leaves them additional money for clothing, health care, entertainment. And so we think uh, there's going to be extremely strong demand for this.
then the quality of the home doesn't lead to much compromise. Not at all. I mean, again, part of that's because we're working under the federal HUD code. I mean, we're building mm -hmm. this to all the specifications. Uh, but really, any home that we're producing, we're using the same materials that someone would use in site construction. So people are getting you know, nice countertops, nice cabinets, good appliances, all of that. There's really no compromise in it. It's just the smaller unit and the density advantages that Sam talked about. And how about the durability? Do these take more maintenance annually for the homeowner? UMH has been pointing out since we started doing rental manufactured homes in 2011, and today we rent out 10,000 homes. If you look at the house, the cost of repair or maintenance it's very low. It's drywall throughout this house. You, you look at the kitchen, we could fix anything in the kitchen. Look at the bedrooms, the bathrooms. So it keeps the maintenance costs low. Uh, the products they use are extremely durable. When you look at those countertops, you look at the, sh the door hinges. So these houses are going to stand up to the rental customer and they're going to keep our costs of maintaining the rental home down. Mm -hmm. right. I'd also add they're highly energy efficient. So right. the customer's getting that benefit as well. And speaking of energy, the, um, maybe in the future there'll be the option for solar panels or Yeah, or these, are, other. these are solar ready, or they can be ordered solar ready, so you can um, make those adjustments on site, actually. Right, right. right. It's like you know, net zero is, is a, you know, a, a big thing, but it, it matters to the community as well. Sure. Right. And yeah. UMH has done extensive work on solar, and when you put the solar shingles on at the factory, it's an incredible savings that other builders can't recognize. Right. So it's another great benefit of factory built homes. We can reduce the cost of solar for the resident lower than any outside builder can do it. We, we nicknamed this house the UMH Tiny, and this is what brings manufactured housing to the tiny home movement. There's a difference between HUD code homes and tiny homes, but not with this duplex single section. This becomes the tiny home. Yeah. It's still very livable. I mean, that 550 square feet goes a long way. It does. I, yeah. You know, I'm looking at this and thinking of the studio apartments that my kids rented just out of college, and um, this is far more generously proportioned, I must say. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we always find it remarkable when people come from the city, and, you know, they come from New York City to our communities in Jackson, and they look at our homes for sale or rent. They're amazed by the size, how, how spacious they are. This home we're in today is the duplex, but we have other homes, the multi-section homes that could be 1,800 square feet, and they look at the quality kitchens, the open spaces, the island in the kitchen, the large sinks, bathrooms, and, and they're just shocked by how great the houses are and the value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you think of the millennials who can't afford to live anywhere, um, moving back in with their parents, um, this certainly opens up new opportunities yeah. too. Those are those unique family situations. I think this will really present a pretty interesting idea for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Do you think ultimately this is a product that you'll use more for rental of a whole house, not just the, the pad, uh, or or that you'll you know that people will want to buy on their own? UMH will use this house as a rental because we manage the rental homes and uh, we prefer that the resident own homes, you know, that they're living in that portion of the unit. Uh, if they wanted to own this as uh, a multi-generational house, mm -hmm. we would sell it that way if, if they wanted the mother-in-law, grandmother, somebody else sharing the occupancy of this unit. But as a rental, we want to manage the community and manage the rental resident. So we would use this house strictly as a rental home. And when you look at what your sales program is for this duplex, do you think that you'll be selling more to communities like UMH that will use them as rentals? Or do you think yeah. you'll be selling them on individual lots where, where people will actually own it? I think the early adoption is probably going to be like Sam's the More the rental but side. But I think mm -hmm. it will get, I mean, I think it's perfectly suited to those single site Mm -hmm. opportunities that we're speaking about mm -hmm. so yeah. it's kind of I, I hope that it's a quick follow-on right. I really think um, you know, I'm very big on the idea of getting manufactured or factory built housing into urban environments and I think this is a product that really is going to open that door but the early adoption you get in to get down that road which I don't foresee as being far in the future you get into questions about financing all right if the if it's going to be an owner 
right, uh, right, home, right, right, right. How do the lenders finance that? Mm -hmm. I think all those issues will be readily handled. Right. Um, but the mm -hmm. easy, the easy early adopter is you know Sam's organization that can put them into rental communities and fill these things up pretty quickly. We we picture any community that's about ninety five percent occupied. If you have a vacant lot, you put this house. There's going to be demand for both halves. We'll collect two rents. The resident will have a reduced cost of living. And so we think, you know, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, Eastern New York, this house is going to work incredibly well. You spoke about generational, you know, between families, but what about the utility of this sort in, in age-restricted communities? It doesn't it seem like the turnover might be, um, you know, maybe slower, I don't know, but um, wouldn't this be an appropriate product for that no, as well? No, absolutely. The, the you know, number of people that, that it's one person or, or a couple, this house is perfect for them and it reduces their cost of living. So right. it's going to be perfect mm -hmm. for that use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of different audiences, yeah. a lot of different clientele, right, in yeah, this is a, a product changer. like this. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see a young family, you know, or a starting family with some of your larger units. And, and I saw on your website that you're also having a prototype, um, uh, a multi-sectional or a duplex. Um. Yeah, multi-section. In fact, that's what came out first. That's what we yeah. showed at Homes on the Hill here in D.C. last year was uh -huh. a two-section home. So each unit is twice as big as these two units, basically. And that's great because you can configure those many different ways. You can right. have the entrance on both entrances on one end of the house. Depending on the community setup, you can have them on opposite ends, or you can have both entrance entrance on the side, even with porches and all that. So there's a lot of flexibility in a lot right. of different floor plans. Right, right, right. And then the length of the common wall would matter as well, right? Some people might not like to have the whole length of their house as a common wall. Might might prefer this shorter because of the noise transfer. But well, it seems like this there, is a I'll tell you quiet. what we found when when we have those those two section units uh -huh. that get put together um, under the HUD code, both, ha both sides have to be an individual HUD coded home. And so we're building firewalls because they're duplexes. Uh -huh. We'll build firewalls on both units. I see. By the time you put that together, the soundproofing is unbelievable. Uh, yeah, much I mean, better been, than, yeah. than uh, your traditional apartment. We, right. we, yeah. we, it's unreal. we showed it last year and there were 15 people in each half and you couldn't hear the 15 people on the other half. <laughs> when, you, when you were on the other side. And the, uh, th those become two bedroom. And so you could either be using two bedrooms or maybe you're using one bedroom as an office. And uh, it, it works. We did the first uh, multi-section duplex, rented both halves right out in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And the people living there enjoy living in it. And we look forward to doing yeah. more of those. That was a good mm -hmm. scientific test we ran last year here, haven't <laughs> yeah. Crowds on both sides, making a lot of noise and not being able to Having a party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, worked very yeah. well. Yeah. What other innovations do you think that could further densify housing, make it more affordable? What, well, what one of the interesting of? things we're working on with the Industry Association and with folks here in D.C. and HUD is the idea of being able to remove the chassis from the definition of manufactured home. Uh, from the beginning of the HUD code, which this is the 50th anniversary of right. HUD being named as the sole regulator for our industry. And when the code was put in place 50 years ago, I mean, I spoke earlier that I just think that's the start of what this industry has become. It's been a great approach. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always defined a manufactured house as not being able to take it off of the chassis. And that's worked great. We will probably always make homes that way. But the idea of being able to remove the chassis under the code, which would require different engineering, it's going to just grow the market. And so for a lot of applications, people that, you know, you might be able to have the home closer on elevation, so it could have some advantages for the exterior aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that'll open up a whole new market. In, in regard to the urban market, th this house could be put on a superior wall system, concrete walls that are nine feet high, the lower level could be a tornado shelter, storage space, additional bedrooms, additional bathrooms. You can double the square footage at a very low cost with the superior wall system and steel beams and then you drop this right on top of that. You have to walk up the steps, which that may not be appealing to the 55 and older crowd, but for the family crowd, uh, you, you, double the, you take one lot in the urban setting 
and you wind up with you know double the square footage on each half right. at a very low price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they, the HUD has not been slow to innovate um, in, in, in modest ways, I think, and, and certainly the quality of the product has been top of their mind, yeah. um, and, and that's totally benefited, you know, the, the, the tenant, but, but also the community as a whole. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to put something on your, in your community that doesn't create a good living experience. Yep. And the um, federal code, really, if you think about it, again, I'm talking the history over 50 years, but that idea of a federal code is what allows us to make homes in one factory that can then be sh sent to places that we don't know where all of them are going to end up when we build them. Right. right? They go to right. dealers, customers come in, buy them, take them to different states, and they can all be confident in the quality of that home because of the HUD code. It, it, it's the past four years that HUD has invited us here for the Innovative Housing Showcase. So they've demonstrated how much they want innovation in affordable housing, and the manufacturers have responded by giving them a fantastic product and a fantastic show each year for the yep. last four years. Yeah, it's interesting that year over year, we're looking at a much smaller footprint here, you know, than right. 550 square feet, um, because that's the way people have been moving, that's where the, where the market's been going, yeah. partly because of its expense, but just having a smaller footprint is easier to control, um, you know, the, the growth in expenses, but, um, you know, it, it's interesting, the progression that, that, that you made here, even at the showcase, yeah. is towards that tiny home, more affordable, and, and yet durable. It is a, a tremendous, it's a staggering, right. you know, number of homes that, uh, that, that are out of the reach of, of a whole generation, really. Yeah. Well, as, I mean, the cost of our homes have, have gone up because of inflation. Then insurance rates shot up, which increases the monthly cost. And you do things like this and you get people back in the game, right? Right. They can, right. They can people have who were otherwise nice, priced out, yep. locked out. And uh, now there's there's just <laughs> it's hard to imagine how you move these you know into position, but I guess you just you move them separately and 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 marry them so to say. Well, in this case, it's one unit, so this leaves the factory as one unit, right? Wow. So that doesn't need to be that maneuvered that much. It comes in on the chassis and you place it with the talented setup crews that can either put it on walls like Sam was talking about, or on piers essentially, mm -hmm. and set up the home and. Um, that's a whole profession in our industry to make sure they're set up properly. Yeah. And if it's multi-section, you add the complexity of basically combining the two sections that were made one after another in the factory to make sure that everything lines mm -hmm. up. Right, right. It's not like you, yeah, had the misfit. That would be. <laughs> yeah, it's not mix and match. This is pretty highly, highly engineered, and, and the factory setting gives us complete control over the process. Does that help with zoning? I mean, it seems like zoning is, is the, kind of the last mile of manufactured housing. Zoning is the last mile, and, and UMH, we tried to develop and build communities, and we found out how difficult that was to do, and we know that only 53 new communities have been built in the country in the last 10 years. And so what UMH did instead is we found communities that were built in the 1960s and 70s and upgrade them, made capital improvements, replaced water and sewer lines, and then took lots that had become vacant and added these brand new factory built homes. And we recognized the group of people earning between $40,000 and $80,000 per year, very difficult for them to buy or rent other forms of housing. And yet with just $40,000 household income, 30% of that income can pay $1,000 per month in rent and we could provide these brand new homes for, for what a person earning $40,000 per year can afford. And this has generated waiting lists at all of our communities for these rental houses. Since just 2011, we've rented out 10,000 homes. So the, the need, it's, it's a $4 million plus shortage of affordable housing in America, and the product, HUD code homes built in the factory, meets that need. So we talked about how you were going to use many of these houses, most of these houses, in fact, at this point, the duplexes, as rentals, and that that can save the tenant about 20% on their monthly rent, which is considerable. So what does the demand factor look like for you? Well, we believe in, in the Northeast communities where we have only 5% vacant lots, 
this house will work easily. That that you know the population's so high, so many people need a quality, affordable place to live. We we see it working easily in those communities that only have five or ten vacant lots. But we're also considering building entire communities, 250 spaces of just duplex homes, because with a four million plus unit shortage of affordable housing and how affordable these homes become. And then you recognize that, you know, the baby boomers are now 65 years old and older, and they just need one or two, it's one or two persons per home. So one bedroom or two bedrooms works fine for them. So we think the demand for this house and the benefits of affordability, leaving them extra money for medicine, food, recreation, clothing, uh, we think the, the demand for these will justify building entire communities for uh, duplex houses. As you think about adding them to your existing communities, what's the size of the lot? And is that different from what you had before? Um, you know, because if you could just take the same lots that you had and, and, and put this kind of a duplex on it, that would obviously be more efficient for you. Exactly. We think it's going to increase the value of each lot. You're going to take your standard 50 by 100 lot. You're going to put this house, instead of having one house that rents for $1,000 per month, you're going to have one unit with collecting two rents. They might be 750 800 850 but But you're going to get more rent per lot. And what we've experienced, the larger communities, a 400-space community is more profitable than a 200-space community because of the economies of scale of managing a larger community. And that's going to work the exact same way with duplex homes. Uh, the profit margin per community will go up. And this all benefits the resident because, you know, the, the, the better the profit margin, the lower rents we need to charge to achieve a good return on investment that attracts the people who give us the money to build communities, buy these homes, and create affordable housing. And how about for your company, this, if you switched over your production to you know, a higher percentage of these kind of duplex homes, wouldn't your profitability improve also? Yeah, I don't see that our margin, we wouldn't necessarily push the margin up specifically on these homes. I mean, we, I always talk inside the company that really we're selling factory time. So it, the see. pricing of our units, whatever we make, Mm -hmm. and this is a little bit of a generalization, but generally the pricing is on a, how much time does that take in our factory? Mm -hmm. If something's gonna slow us down, we're gonna have to charge more. If it's gonna go through quickly, we'll charge less. Um, a unit like this, a single section, but it's got twice the wet areas, right? It's got two kitchens, two bathrooms, where another single section might move faster because it doesn't have as much complexity in the construction. Mm -hmm. So the pricing might be a bit higher but it's really because of how it affects our production process as opposed to necessarily higher margins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. UMH has recognized that you know, the demand for rental manufactured homes was so strong that we added 10,000 rental homes since 2011. Uh, we think this product could work anywhere and maybe we could expand our footprint to additional states, provide this in more locations and continue to grow UMH faster through these duplex homes. Yeah. Certainly the volume helps our profitability, right? right. The gross margin might not right. be higher, but being able to get more units is really what we're after. Right, right. And, and that's, that's what I was just thinking. I mean, and the interest rates that make it prohibitive for people to buy homes. Could you envision a time when, when your, your communities are all rental? We, we, we're building and filling Memphis Blues as an all rental community today. Uh, we are perfectly happy to do all rental communities. There was a financing issue with uh, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. We resolved that and they now yes. finance communities with rental homes. Uh, we proved through COVID that people like this product so much that even when they lost their jobs as waiters and waitresses, they found other jobs to keep this house. They didn't want to lose their manufactured home with their 5,000 square foot lot. And so they took new jobs as truck drivers or in warehouses. And we maintain 95% rental home occupancy and 98% rent collection through COVID. And then we recognize that our product as a rental house is so competitive against apartments. If you try to build a brand new apartment, it's $350,000 for a thousand square foot. Yet we can obtain a lot and this house 
and, and provide a rental unit that costs us $110,000 to build. Nobody else can compete with that, which is why this will work anywhere and why UMH seeks to grow and do it anywhere, both as all rental communities and, and communities that are a mixture. We've learned, you know, when somebody's renting the house and people who think they're staying at a location one to three years probably want to be a rental customer, makes it easy for them to come in and to go out. They just need one month rent and one month security. They need household income of about $40,000 and then they can come in, rent the house and their rent only goes up 5% per year. But if they actually own the house, the rent goes up even less because the portion that's their note doesn't go up at all. Right. They're building equity in their house every year. And so the lot rent portion, which is generally half the rent. So if this house rents for $1,000 per month, the lot rent is probably about 500 per month, but they're receiving a 5% increase on the 500 and they'll get that every year as opposed to a 5% increase on the 1,000, which they would get in a rental home. So if you know you're gonna stay in a place the rest of your life for 10 years, you probably wanna own the home because your rent won't go up as much and you're building equity and then eventually the home could be sold UMH sold, every house we sold until that 2009 housing crisis actually went up in value. The customer could actually sell the house for more than they paid us for it. And, and, and that even happened in a short period of times. They might have moved into the communities we built in Vineland, New Jersey, or Highland Estates near Allentown, Pennsylvania. And within one year, they were selling the house for more than they paid us for it. And it's only that 2009 to 2011 period that wasn't true. But today it's true again. They buy a house from us and it actually goes up in value. So buying a house is a good thing to do if you know you're staying, if mm -hmm. you don't mind tying up your money, if you qualify. But, but so many people, if you're earning between 40,000 and 80,000 per year, it's hard to have the 10% down. Uh, you might have student loans, medical bill issues, business failure, divorce, and then renting becomes the option. Or if you think you're just staying for a short period of time, then you just want to rent so it's easy to relocate. And I was just going to say, mobility is such a big factor, um, particularly with the younger generations that don't seem to want to make a, a long, you know, lifelong commitment to live 50 years in one location. Mm -hmm. They want to move to where the jobs are, you know, move to where the sun shines. <laughs> I don't know, but they seem to be a lot more mobile. Renting has also dramatically helped getting young people to accept the manufactured home and community product. Prior to that, you had to make the huge commitment to buy Correct, a house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you only need to make the commitment of a one-year lease, people are willing to come try something new, which new to them is the manufactured home in the community. And so we rent out eight homes for every one we sell. And again, since 2011, we've rented out 10,000 manufactured homes. One part of the reason why those they'll work as you were giving the example, even if they lose their job, they'll try to stay there is not only the house, it's the community. Yes. And we call them communities, but these, what these folks are building are neighborhoods, right? Right. which is a whole different living experience. And I think that's mm -hmm. an important part of the value proposition they offer. I wanted to also, if I could, piggyback off the point about appreciation. I mean, one of the misnomers about our industry is that a site-built house appreciates and a manufactured home depreciates. Like and a it's, it's really, in, in, it's not, you know, studies, everything has shown that that's not true. The, the land and home, land pretty much generally appreciates over right. time. But with the home, if it's a quality home and it's taken care of, whether it's site-built or manufactured housing, if it's taken care of, it can appreciate as well. So mm -hmm. it's really, you know, the quality is not different in that, you know, we're at no disadvantage for appreciation relative to site-built structures. Um, everything's got to be taken care of in order for it to appreciate. But if you do that, right, these homes right, last right. a long time. We, we bought our first rental homes in 2011 with setup, $40,000 a piece, and we wanted to gross 20%, so we collected $8,000 per year, about $700 per month rent. Today, those exact same homes to replace them is $80,000, and they rent for over $1,000 per month. So those homes have really appreciated from $40,000 to $70,000, and originally we rented them out $700 per month, and now it's $1,000 per month. Yep. So, and, and a giant question, 
by investors when we shifted to rentals was would those homes depreciate? Well, they didn't depreciate. They appreciated. Replacement cost has virtually doubled, and, and the rents have gone from 700 to 1000 per month. Yeah. And right. for, those, for those that can buy, you know, mm -hmm. the people that we're serving that can buy, this is their only way to participate in that wealth building effect that you're talking about. So it's pretty important. I mean, we'll right. talk about the wealth building effect of home ownership. Store a lot value. of people are outside mm -hmm. of that opportunity, but we're giving them the opportunity with these products and the communities that Sam owns. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, one hundred percent of UMH's income meets HUD's definition of affordable, so that Sustainalytics, an independent firm, has determined that one hundred percent of our income is social for ESG metrics uh, as a New York Stock Exchange company. So it's pretty That's remarkable. Awesome. Uh, amazingly, European investors care more about that than American investors. We have specific European funds who choose and invest in UMH just because of that sustainability designation. Well, hopefully that spreads. Yes. I think yeah. that's a, that it is, it's virtuous, and yes. that always feels good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, the, the American dream is a home and a community, and these affordable homes provide a home for a wage, so many times the family unit can be affected by the fact that they can't afford a home. But by providing an affordable home, it, it helps the family unit. And then UMH operates a community of 250 or more up to one of our communities, it's three next to each other, but it amounts to 900 lots together. And it provides a real sense of community so that our residents on only $40,000 per year, experience the American dream of a home and a community.